Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. Uh, I'm very excited to have you with us today for another one of our live streamed episodes um, of Mormon Stories Podcast, live streamed to Facebook, I mean. It's August 17th, 2017, and uh, we have a really cool topic in store for you today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to someone who I've been interacting with at least for 10 years, if not a little bit more, uh, and he's someone whose name won't be familiar to many of you, his, or, or, or maybe it will be. His name is Jason Eccles, um, and Jason, on the Ex-Mormon subreddit, you're known as what? Chino Blanco. Chino Blanco, and that was your handle back in the forum days as well. Um, Sadly. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to be talking about the phenomenon that is Ex-Mormon Reddit. Now, uh, we, we interviewed uh, Mithrin a while back, and for some reason I don't even know why that interview was never published. So we need to go back and interview him. Uh, we've also interviewed uh, Ryan McKnight. We've talked about Reddit there. But as, if, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time we've sort of talked about ex-Mormon Reddit as its own phenomenon. And I just want to make sure everyone over on the ex-Mormon Reddit knows that I'm completely willing to do other episodes to include other voices. But um, I've been wanting to interview Jason for a long time, and this is just one way to do it. And, and Jason's been a leader pioneer in, in ex-Mormon Reddit and Mormonism on Reddit for many years. And so in many ways, this makes sense. Before we jump into the interview, uh, we always have a few announcements. I want to encourage people to follow the Mormon Stories podcast uh, account on Instagram if you're not already. We're trying to beef up our Instagram presence. We also have a Twitter account at Mormon Stories. Um, please like us on Facebook, the Mormon Stories podcast, if you're joining us through the Mormon Stories podcast page. If you uh, like us there or give us a positive review on the Mormon Stories podcast page, that's a way you can support us and help us grow uh, if you're not in a position to support us financially. So please consider that. Also, giving us a positive review on iTunes. If you'll open up iTunes, log into iTunes, give Mormon Stories a positive review. All those sorts of things really help uh, grow our presence. So please support us. Um, just want to announce really briefly, we've got several events coming up. Uh, Seattle, Washington, September 14th and 15th. Uh, we're doing a, a Mormon Transitions workshop. We're going, hopefully, to Sydney, Australia, October 20th through 22nd. That retreat is in question because we've only got about 11 people who have signed up, and we, we did the numbers, and we needed at least 20 to justify that event. So uh, that's, that's up in the air, but uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco, November 9th through 10th is, uh, is definitely still on. That, that won't change, um, so plan for that. And um, we're looking for your nominations for 2018 events. Houston has shown a lot of interest. We've had interest shown from other areas. But if you want us to bring a workshop or retreat to your area um, where we talk about mixed faith marriages, Mormon transitions, secular or, or alternative spirituality, uh, mental health education, those sorts of things, just email us at mormonstories dot uh, at gmail.com and let us know you want us to bring an event to your area and then finally uh fall october 24th to 28 2018 we're doing a mormon stories cruise to the bahamas several people have signed up a few slots are left or slots are left if you want to join us please sign up you can go to mormonstories.org slash events for all these activities um and those are the announcements um, so without any further ado, I'm really excited to introduce our guest, uh, Jason Eccles. Again, today's topic is the Ex-Mormon subreddit. And uh, Jason, why don't, why don't we begin with, first of all, welcoming you to Mormon Stories Podcast. Is this your first time to appear? Yeah, you know, John, this may, this may very well be my last time to appear. <laughs> if you call me a leader at Rex Mormon, you're going to ruin my street cred. Okay. I don't mind pioneer because I think Exmo is sort of embody the pioneer spirit, but yeah, no leader. Okay. Pioneer, <laughs> pioneer Jason Eccles. Um, and why your last time to appear? Cause you don't want to be called a leader. Oh, I'm or? giving you a hard time. Just okay. please don't call me a leader. I'll, I'll get zero <laughs> karma. If... <laughs> All right. And we'll get into what karma is. So Jason, let's, before we jump into Reddit, let's just jump into your story a little bit. 
just tell us about your history uh, as as a Mormon, as an ex Mormon, as a post Mormon, and let's even talk about you know what made you want to become an activist after the church didn't work out for you. Let's talk about some of your early involvement in some of the other online offerings where you and I first met, like the the forums and the blogs, uh, and then we'll jump into Reddit. Is that all right? That's fine as long as you help me keep my train of thought. You just kind of went through a long list. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's okay. start with your just Mormon background. Oh, I mean, pretty, pretty traditional, I think. Uh, grew up in the mission field. Great fam. Went to BYU my freshman year and then went off to a mission to Brazil. Uh, you know, when I got back from the mission, this is early 90s. And I think a word, how do you say it? Retrenchment? Sure. Yeah, and I, and I think the early 90s, so I was a freshman in what, late 80s, went off for a mission, came back early 90s, and it felt like things were kind of clamping, tightening up a bit. You know, I was in the honors colloquium my freshman year, Mazer Building. What I year thought, was wow. that? What year was that? So this is what, I graduated 85 okay, from high cool. school, so it would have been like 85, 86, 87, I would have been around campus, and just loved the Mazer Building, loved the crowd there, loved the professors. I mean, okay, wait a second. You did a Mormon stories with Ted Lyon, right? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic and, guy. I mean, yeah. just just real, just a beautiful man, a beautiful person. Um, that was my first exposure to BYU was that freshman year with guys like Ted. So you classes. did the you did the shaping the modern mind colloquium with yeah yeah with and Ted I, Lyon, I, Clayton White, and Lynn England. Is and, that right? Oh, and Lynn England, another great guy. But yeah. Um, yeah, and so that was my that was my first impression of BYU was going through that experience. My roommates were great. Helaman Halls was just a blast. I was having a good time. Um, was it you? Did you say you were in Chipman? Helaman. But, but, but I, Chipman, I don't remember, were you in the honor which, storm? Pardon? The, the honor yeah, storm so was Chipman was, back then. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So Helaman Halls. Yeah, I loved it. Um, yeah, and ended up going on my mission. Uh, had a I'd call it, I'd call it a fairly successful mission and got back and they had instituted this thing where you were required to attend church every Sunday. And that didn't sit right with me as an RM. Okay. And I, I think I, at that point I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to transfer out. And I just started looking at options for, for getting out of BYU. And that just sort of started my whole. Really? Well, I, okay, my personality type, and I think, you know, there's a, if we start talking about Rex Mormon and this whole mix of different, what ex-Mormons, what motivates them to leave the church, I, I've always not responded well to coercion. Okay. And I think that was pretty much what turned me off was coming back. And in the early 90s, it felt like camp, the campus was changing. Uh, it felt like it felt coercive to tell an RM. I was, you know, you leave a, you leave a fairly, you know, you're a teenager and you come back a young man. And they're still expecting you to live by the Sunday school rules from pre-mission. Right. That was, that was pretty much it. I mean, it was just sort of bridling at, at, the, at the sense on campus that things were just tightening up. And Yeah, and, and after you left, I mean, as things advanced into the late, late 80s, early 90s, you've got the September 6th excommunications, you've got all the academic freedom stuff that happened at BYU with Gail Houston and, and uh, David Knowlton and all that stuff. Were you there for all that? Well, this is, so this is what 91 it's a, you could, you could sense, you know, this is 90, 91. I think you could sense that that was coming around the pike. Yeah. Right. What, when did you leave BYU? That would have been 90. Okay, so you left before the stuff really got bad. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, tra I transferred out to to NYU. Oh wow. To New York. Okay. But so that, you... speaking speaking of the the those professors from from my freshman year, though, going and talking to them and saying, "Hey, this is how I'm feeling about how you know my experience is now compared to freshman year," and they're like, "If you're planning to go to New York to have an experience, just go. You know, uh -huh. do it. You deserve. You know, you deserve it if that's what you want." So that's so cool. Um. Okay, so would you say when you left BYU, you kind of lost your testimony and left the church? Well, I'd always had doubts. Um, I, think, I think I'm one of those. I'd always had doubts. For me, the question of whether or not the church is true, I mean, by 14 or 15, I pretty much knew that objectively it's not what I would put in the true category. Um, but if you're talking about an institution that has the, the 
capacity to do good in the world. I, you know, I was always a joiner. I wanted to join something that, that was put, put you on a mission. I enjoyed the mission. I enjoyed having goals and objectives and achieving those and feeling like, you know, I'm Facebook friends with some of the kids I baptized in Brazil and I have no apologies for, for that. And I love the fact that they've actually gone on and gone to BYU and have great lives, I think, because of what we were doing down there. But cool. But but you definitely you're you're saying from a young age you kind of knew the church wasn't what it claimed to be, but you still served a mission. Right. The truth claims were never really the that that wasn't what sort of pushed me away. Was it hard to serve a mission when you weren't really believing the truth claims? Not, I, I think if you like people, if you enjoy working with people and the mission sort of like, as long as I got really lucky though, I have to sort of caveat this because I got put in a place that was 24 hours away from the mission office. I had a really great mission president who just, yeah, he's not one of the horror stories. He's one of the good guys. So I just got lucky all around in terms of my mission and being posted far away, being given responsibility fairly early on to be branch president, to, to sort of do things that weren't tracking right. 24 seven. Yeah. I, that was, and, and my frustration on the mission was mostly we had a, we had a area authority come down and as a branch president, I had sort of the opportunity to see what I thought would work in my corner of the world. Right. And we did make it work and we had, a, we ended up with a vibrant branch. And I thought that just, we were doing great stuff for people, providing a, you know, a structure for people to improve their lives, make new friendships, learn some good things on a Sunday. Um, and I just didn't get the sense that the guys that I was reporting to above our mission president, like once you got above that level, that they had any real interest in figuring it out. Like, how can we do better? How can we apply some of this? Get away from the whole idea of knocking doors and just the terrible, well, I was in South America. So, you know, it's terrible retention. Animosity builds up between the missionaries and the old time local leadership. There's just all these dysfunctional things going on within the system, but then nobody was addressing sort of the systemic issues. And at the same time, the, the new evangelical movements in Brazil were taking off. I mean, we were getting our asses handed to us on a plate if you look at it competitively. But you they still were, had the numbers is the thing. But the numbers were, but they were illusory. I mean, it was completely illusory. It was, it was you know, outside of my work that I did as a branch president, which was the best part of my mission, everything mm -hmm. else was just generating numbers that were not going to pan out because the retention rate was so poor. Did you, guys have this, did you guys have the same kind of fraudulent baptism tactics that I had in Guatemala and that, it and was, that Elder Holland and Ted Lyon talked about in Chile? It, it had gotten better than in those times. Our, and, and this goes to our mission president. His approach was he was not putting huge pressure on us, mm -hmm. but there were, it was still definitely numbers oriented. And like my path to being an assistant was definitely founded on doing things like baptizing five weeks out of a five week month, right? getting a baptism every week in a five week month that would give you the golden eagle. And that's what was driving. And were you, an, were you an assistant? Yeah, sure. Oh, so you made it, you got the numbers and you made assistant. Oh yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. 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 I mean, no. the, the, the mission to me was a world that I feel comfortable in. I mean, I've been doing sales ever since I got, I basically left university because I enjoy, I, I would rather be in business and be out in the world just basically dealing with people yeah, sure, and not stuck in it. In a, in a, I, I love my professors. I did comparative literature. I'm someone who thought, Hey, I'm going to just be an egghead and, you know, spend the rest of my life teaching and reading and, ha you know, having a cubicle in a small school somewhere. But once I saw what that life was, I realized I've got to either really love this and I don't, I mean, I, I don't love it enough to, to devote myself to that. So I went back to my other love, which is basically just traveling the world, selling stuff. Got it. Just a few comments from our listeners. Um, David writes, he had a terrible mission. Um, uh, Tamara writes, I love my mission, but experienced the stress of numbers and saw many others engage in kitty baptisms. She writes, we did in uh, 1992 in Brazil. Numbers, numbers, numbers is what Tamara writes. Um, David writes, that was the first thing I realized a mission was about numbers. Anyway, a lot of people had that experience. Um, and... Uh, of course, we love that Kimberly Anderson has joined us, and she writes, 
are ex-Mormon. We have no leader. Beep, boop, bop. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you're getting me in hot water, John. <laughs> no leaders. All right. And shout out to Wayne, who's joining us from Denver. Logan from uh, Salt Lake. Gina Colvin's joining us from New Zealand. Lots of cool people have joined. Uh, welcome to all our all our listeners who have joined us from all, all over the world. We have um, close to 100 people already joining us. All right. So I've never Jason, met Gina, but I'll tell you what, this is your chance. Take your best shot. Take your shot at him, Gina. Take your <laughs> shot at Jason. He's ready for you. Um, all right. Uh, so, so Jason, so you go to BYU, you don't like the requirement that BYU people, what, go, you know, um, attend church, you bail and you pretty much leave the church behind by then when you go to New York. Yeah. Or, I mean, I, I, grad, I graduated from NYU, did it, worked a year in a law office in LA. And then I, I, I actually just bailed on the country and went to Asia. Okay. Um, and so that's, um, so that was the end of your active membership in the church. Right. And I didn't spend a whole time, a whole lot of time thinking about it, to be honest, after those few years. So what are your earliest memories of sort of being engaged in online Mormonism or post-Mormonism? Do you remember the years or the websites or the ways that you got engaged that way? I don't, you know. Like, was it, was it forums? I know that I met you first on Flack, Further Light Knowledge, which was an internet forum uh, where, where before Facebook, before blogs, uh, you know, questioning Mormons, liberal Mormons, post-Mormons this is, could this all... Is the, this is the way I remember topics. it. Okay. The way I remember it is Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo used to run something called TPM Cafe. And there was a, a group of some fairly smart political commentators who unpaid, similar to what we have now, but this is years ago, sort of really doing a great job of going behind the story, explaining everything. It was a nice place to hang out. And you could just rub shoulders with some fairly, with diplomats and, and guys who are in the, the foreign policy world. Anyway, I, I, li I liked hanging out there. And then Prop 8 hit. And all of a sudden, all this Mormon stuff was coming up. And I'm going, you know what? I think I've probably got something of an inside handle on what's driving Mormon involvement in this issue and how it's going to play out and how they're going to structure the campaign and all of that. So that's, for me, that was kind of the beginning. I think prior to June of 2008, I think it would be, I'm not sure that I was aware of. So you weren't listening to podcasts like Mormon stories podcasts from the beginning, like 2005, and you weren't, you weren't like paying attention to, you know, times no, and seasons and by common consent and feminist Mormon housewife blogs, uh, no, 2004, I, 2005. I'm, I'm happily married in Taiwan, you know, okay, getting it. on with my, getting on with my life. And then that hit when prop eight, when that started bubbling up, I thought, you know, some of my interest in politics generally sort of segues. What was it about prop eight that was personally interesting for you enough to bring you back into online Mormon activism, so to speak? Well, okay, so I'd had friends come out to me while I was at BYU. And, you know, this is, this is the main issue with Mormonism with me, the, the thing, thing that rubs me the wrong way, is that there has been a history since, I would say, post-World War II, where the leadership has had, every decade they've had to identify sort of an enemy to motivate the troops. And whether it's the 70s with ERA, whether it's now with the LGBT, LGBT community. Intellectuals in the 80s and 90s. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's the whole sort of- Gays, the, gays feminists, and intellectuals, right? There you go. It's, it's that Boyd K. Packer <laughs> summa, you know, summary of you know, the, the boogeymen that are out there. Um, yeah, I, I, I have some pretty strong personal feelings about how that plays out and sort of the damage it does, so. Okay, so you just, you've seen it hurt people. The LGBT issue was one you were very sensitive about. And just structurally, you don't like the LDS church always picking on vulnerable populations as enemies. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so you join, you join in on some of those online discussions and uh, what are, 
what what are your memories of sort of how your involvement progressed which sites you spent time on and how you know how effective you thought they were what you thought they well, missed yeah and then what led to your involvement in reddit well i was and i wasn't initially involved with with anything like a a mormon site it, it, most of my, the sites i was involved with with politics uh, a lot of just the lgbt activists and the democratic activists in california I was pumping information about what I saw coming out of the Prop 8 campaign to them saying, you know, there's some, there's some serious LDS involvement at the nuts and bolts level of these, of this campaign that you need to be aware of. And that's, I did that for a few months. I mean, I mean, one of the feathers in my cap, I, I can't say any names, but early on, this, I mean, this is like June, July, the initial, I think the initial strategy with, with, with Prop 8 was to run it the same way it had always been run where the Mormons would be in the background funding getting the ground game in place all of that and then letting sort of the focus on the family christian groups sort of be the public face of it and sort of the first step in sort of pulling the curtain back was got in touch with some guys started looking at who was running that the christian face of it and realized you know these guys it it didn't take much to get go to the orange county register and say here's the piece already written where you can talk about these guys are fairly dirty. They don't report their, their contributions the right way. Meaning the Mormon church when you say this. No, no, no. The, the, the or the Christian, Christian, the Christian, okay. The Christian groups that were tasked with being the public face. Got it. And, and you know, these guys are a lot more loosey goosey than, than the LDS. Like as, as, as Mormons, we tend to be fairly efficient, fairly, you know, we dot our I's, cross our T's, you know, and, and when you get more into say these dispersed Christian congregations, where we have pastors that, that rally their troops around something, they may not pay as much attention to where the money's going. They might, may not pay attention to like election reporting laws, those kinds of things. And that was just sort of the, the first salvo was to look at who's fronting this so that the Mormons don't have to be up front and kind of getting them out of the picture because they couldn't do it anymore because they were tainted. There were, there were news stories coming out. And so then the Mormons had to step up. But also the church, the Mormon church was hiding its involvement in Proposition 8. Well, they, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like they, they were hiding it yeah, and you right. had to sort of get that evangelical Christian element sort of out of the way so you could peer in and see here's who's really doing it. I mean, if you look at the actors in the TV ads, if you look at the communications director, all of the, the names we could run through, they're all Mormon. Like Matt that, Holland, Jeff Holland's son and all that stuff, right? Oh, it, it goes all the way down to... Wick, I mean, Wickman, Ballard... Uh, who was the student bar president of the University of Utah? Yeah, his wife. I mean, she was she was the communications director. You had the the, the guy in the first very first TV ad was a, was a professor at what's was it Pepperdine? He's a Mormon guy. I mean, it's just, it was Mormon through and through. Right, and so you helped sort of gather that information and coordinate with reporters to help shine a spotlight on the Mormon involvement in Prop Eight. It's a kind of volunteer opposition mm -hmm. research. Is how I'd put it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was in debate in high school. And so <laughs> yeah. sort of had, had the skill set that I don't get to use very often. And it was fun to sort of go back and use that again. Okay. And so Prop 8 happens. And, at, you know, speaking about the platforms, I know you, you commented a lot on like By Common Consent, Times and Season blogs right. back in the day. Talk about... You know, Sorry to, sorry to interject. Yeah, that's when, when Prop 8 happened and all of a sudden, John, it was amazing. Every member, there was this thing called blogs and I think members had just become aware that there were actually like personal blogs. There were thousands of family blogs and personal blogs that Mormons were posting these sort of yes on eight type messages online, but I don't think they had any concept of how the, the platform actually works. So you'd show up and comment on their blog and they'd be like, what are you doing here? Why are you showing up on my blog with mm -hmm. a contrary view? And I said, well, because you guys are geniuses, basically because they really hadn't trained the membership on how to use the internet other than saying, you know, get online and take this message out there and do this. They created this matrix that was very easy to track and find all of the information about how the campaign was running. And that all got combed. That was all taken from members' blogs. They would got say, it. oh, I'm going to this rally this Friday. Oh, we've got a thousand yard signs showing up Thursday. This is going on, that's going on. This is who we're talking to. And you just get, you basically piece it all together. And then all of a sudden you have their game plan right there in front right. of you. And so you've got the story written and you send it over to the media. But you were also commenting on substantive dis, dis, 
conversations on bicomic consent, feminist Mormon housewives, etc. You were part of the intellectual community of, of conversance around Mormon theme well, topics. I mean, I, I, I can do intellectual. Yeah. It, it gets a bit tiresome in the Mormon context doing it for very long. Sure. Because you, you get through sort of the issues and. Yeah, totally. So can you remember, you know, the platforms you, in just a high level quick, the platforms you got involved with, including like Recovery for Mormonism and others, the blogs, Recovery for Mormonism, and what your experiences were that led you to think Reddit might be a platform worth investing in? So in terms of evolution, I mean, yeah, there was a period where I was definitely at by common consent, times and seasons. I had actually one of one of the mods either at tns or at bcc had noticed one of my tpm cafe posts that i'd gone off on on mormon involvement in prop 8 and they had were taking it apart and so i came over and said hey, well if we're going to start this conversation let's do this and so i and, and then once i saw it i got hooked on on sort of that community and to be honest to be fair i mean the kind of folks who are commenting at times and seasons and by common consent if the Mormon church were by and large populated by people who were talking about it at that level, I probably wouldn't even be here having this discussion with you because it would be doing fine. I mean, right. Um, and then after that, in the wake of prop eight, there was this place called, I call it flack further light and knowledge. I think you call it the foyer. Yeah. Yeah. And then I saw these guys and I'm going, Oh my gosh, they know everything about the, in, like the in and out of what's going on with, with the church. And I don't know if you know the Prop 8 documentary. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, Mormon proposition, yeah. A lot of sort of, a lot of that information for that was being sort of spoon fed to the folks who needed information on how, you know, so what's, what's the content that's going into this? Well, you could go to these guys and say, well, where can I get this audio? Where can I get this transcript? Where can I get, you know, just the materials that we need to put together right. something, you know? So if, if you look at the producer for, for Prop 8, for that documentary, he relied a lot on, on the folks at Flack who will never get any acknowledgement. That but, was Reed. That was Reed Cowan, right? Well, Reed, Reed, Reed was sort of the, I would say the beautiful face of it, you know, and, but if you look, Stephen Greenstreet was the producer. Right. And he was, he was the one who, and he's got a history of doing some really nice documentary work. And I think he's the one who really pulled it off. Okay. So Flack was helpful. Flack, and Flack then, was very helpful. And then what other platforms did you engage in before you went to? That's pretty much it. I was, I was in Flack, sort of having this back and forth with some of the regulars there about, you know, <clears throat> content. And then Measure Se this, this user called Measure76 pops up and says, you know what, there's this new platform called Reddit. I'm, on, I'm inviting folks to come over and give this a go. Okay, before we do that, though, I think Recovery for Mormonism was a major platform for you, right? No, I know. I well, I'm trying to think if I if I ever posted there very up. I mean, you that know? was a juggernaut. That was a there was a time when all the blogs paled in comparison to the volume and traffic of 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 recovery for Mormonism. Uh, so yeah, were, I, were were you did you yeah, know did you never one did you never participate there and two did you have any experiences there that made you feel like something else was needed? No, I mean I probably got a few dozen posts that were there in terms of popping by and I mean there was a there was a point in my life where I was probably posting at you know 50 different sites in the, dealing with the whole prop 8 thing um, yeah so I'm probably I've probably got a dozen well, was there any the experiences RFM, was there any experience you had with RFM that made you feel like something else was needed I well, seem to remember you basically saying we need to ditch RFM and go to reddit that's my memory maybe you didn't No you're you're absolutely right I mean the, the fact is it's it's the whole coding for the platform is stuck in, you know, decades ago. I mean, it's just, it's, it's ancient history in terms of how the site is actually coded. It looks like 1990s HTML. So it didn't look great. Were there any other doesn't things? It doesn't look good. Um, you, you've got, I mean, site management is a huge over, it's a huge burden for anyone who's going to run a site like that. Right. So I'm not, I'm not dissing the right. guys who are trying to run that platform, but I think they were burdened by the fact that they had to own, the management of that site while they're also trying to moderate the site. And they also had a few celebrities involved in the site who they couldn't really, you couldn't allow a completely open discussion because it would get very cantankerous 
And there was a lot of, I would say there was a, a surfate of incrimination and just a, a negative vibe that I didn't like. Yeah. And I, but I think a lot of times it's just because of the platform itself and just sort of the system itself was not conducive to moderating that out. They were kind of stuck with it. And, and we should just say it's an amazing platform. It's still got a, a community. I don't go there anymore, but it's still got a community going. It's not like we're saying they sucked or that they were awesome. And, they played yeah, I mean, a really important role for a long, long time, and they're still playing a role. But obviously, there was something wanting that 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 left a door open for X Mormon Reddit, right? Yeah, I mean, there were a couple. Of, there's been you know multiple discussions with with those with that crew over there saying, "Hey, you know what? If we put together you know X amount of dollars, would you, would you let us like help you bring your site up to speed?" I mean, as an ex Mormon, that site is not representative of sort of where the younger generation of Exmos are at. I mean, just in terms of like the technical aspect of it I, with, with not a lot of money, we could help them have a site that would be easier to use. It would look, look nicer, just sort of represent us better. Yeah. And for what, for whatever reasons that was not interesting and that's, that's okay. That's fine. And so, and so there was this platform called, well, a long time ago you had to create your own aggregator there would be these programs where you could put a bunch of RSS feeds in it and have them aggregate various Mormon news sources, the blogs and the podcasts into an aggregator, but that sucked. And then you had sites like dig come online yeah. where dig tried to allow you to be able to post links to news stories and have people upvote and downvote. slash dot was a big deal back then. And I think dig was trying to build off of slash dot fark.com i mean there's just there's a hall of fame of like sort of early adopters of the aggregation game and how to do it and reddit just sort of won that contest yeah so reddit so okay so tell us when you remember reddit coming on the scene and how you got involved well so it was really said, just that inv it was that invitation from measure 76 and so we come over and we i think we literally started with like six people okay and it's kind of like kind of like the lds church in 1830 Exactly. You know, and, and until today, well, we'll get into our, our current stats later, but um, yeah, the growth has been really amazing, but yeah, six people. And you're just, you're constantly thinking about, well, how do you, how do you dr draw attention to the subreddit? What do you do? You go into larger subreddits and say, Hey, I, we, there's some really, there's this really cool story over in this little subreddit called X Mormon. Come check it out. And that, yeah, the early years was definitely about a few people posting content at a fairly rapid clip to keep, get people interested in the platform. Okay, and, and uh, do you know around what year the ex-Mormon subreddit began? It was what, 2009? 2009? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's posted right, actually, if I just look at the, at the subreddit itself. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pull it up. And what I wanna do now <clears throat> um, is talk about, okay, so you talked about we talked about this before we started the show, some of the concerns about these sites, and this is true with the blogs, the podcasts, the forums, you know, RFM there. Let's go through the list of concerns that, that make a forum like Reddit, ex Mormon subreddit really valuable. So you, the first thing you mentioned was just technology, right? That it looks good, that it's got current code. And I think you've already expressed that concern. Talk about the importance of ownership and management as it relates to these communities. What you want, well, what you don't want. Right. Well, I mean, it, it offloads that whole headache of having one group or one person who owns the site, who basically you're accountable to that. You know, you, the, 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 the forum has to sort of pass muster with them. So that sets something there. And if I they think, get sick or if they die or if they get mad... They can yeah, just, and, if, and, if, and if you're ex Mormoning in a way that's different from their approach to ex Mormoning, then you know there's going to be endless meta discussions about that. Uh, or th like, New, or of, like, or like New Order Mormon, the whole site could disappear. Like New Order Mormon right. was this instrumental, pivotal site for well over a decade, and now it's been taken down, and no one knows where it is, and all that old contents just disappeared. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a disaster. It's a huge loss. Right? Sure. Yeah. Any other things about ownership and management, or does that is that cover? Well, that's that a, one? that's about it. I mean, I, I one of the things that's happened as we've as we've reached sort of a critical mass is we've just gotten away from. In the past, I think every blog, every sort of place had its own feeling and personality, right? Yeah. 
So you'd have BCC, you'd have TNS, you'd have FMH, and they all had kind of their own thing going on. And there was always sort of a leadership level that was sort of guiding the, 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 the tone of the discussion. Editorial, the editorializing, Editor right? Right, yeah. right. So there was editorial leadership. And at, at Rex Mormon, that's really, that's, that's gone. So anything goes, right? And it's the user base is going to drive. And that's when we get into what karma is and upvoting. Okay. But the user base sort of drives what's interesting to this forum today. Right. It okay. may be something completely different than what was interesting a week ago. Okay. So in terms of principles, we've got ownership management, we've got moderation, we've got the lessening of dominant personalities as sort of this critical, um, you know, component of the site's success. Although there are personalities on X Mormon Reddit, but you don't get the sense that everybody's scared about offending one dominant personality, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can be taken to task just as much as the guy who joined Reddit yesterday. Right. Okay. Then there's this idea of voting, which helps with content quality, right? You want, you want some way to kind of have the good stuff float to the top exactly. and the lame stuff go to the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And then you want some type of filtering where, where if you want to look at, at information from different slices or views, you can do that. So those are some of the features or themes that I think led to ex-Mormon Reddit's sort of success. Is that true? Sure. And I, and I think if you look at, okay, so look at the blogosphere or the blogger knackle, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And didn't they used to have, like, they had annual awards that they would do, right? They'd yeah, have, the, the, the Brody Awards, the, right? Well, the Brody Awards, is that's that's from our, our world. That's that's. Oh, Carol but they used Oak. to have they used to have their own awards. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, whatever they called them, you know. And BCC would always rig it so they'd win every year. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that in. But not just that, but there was a, there was an aggregator called Mormon Archipelago, and it's still there. LDSblogs.org, and you could only get on it if you were faithful enough. So they would and keep people, you. Up. Yeah, there was this whole litmus test to see which blogs could be included, and it was like it was a. It's actually a well done aggregator. But just the hoops and the drama involved in getting your, your blog in, included in that and then having these annual awards that are, that are sort of like creating this hierarchy of, anyway, the gals at FMH would be much more aware of sort of the, that, that drama than I would. They always got treated terribly by the patriarchy. But yeah, and if, and if you go to ldsblogs.org, no one knows about it anymore. It's never mentioned uh, they well, have, I think, I think are, aren't, aren't the, the awards that the blogger now used to give out, I think they've gone away. I yeah, they have. Were... But just that whole culture, these, these faithful intellectual Mormons like Steve Evans and, mm -hmm. and you know, Artis Prashal and Kevin Barney and whoever else, mm -hmm. that they, would, they were gatekeepers. And if you, and if you, did, if you weren't faithful enough, if you weren't their type right. of intellectual enough, they could just cut you out and you were out of the conversation. They ban you from their blogs and then you're done, right? Well, and I, and I think now at this point, it's kind of that approach has sort of played itself out and the, the amount of traffic they get now and their relevance, they've sort of, they've earned that. Yeah, with yeah. Their, the, their, their, yeah. Even the yeah. blogs, even the blogs, it, BCC still exists, Times of Season still exists, but their, the percentage or the level of their relative influence is dwarfed by... Right by podcasts, by ex-Mormon Reddit, by other influences, right? Yeah, and I, th I think we sort of took over the idea of setting the agenda of topics and sort of saying what's popular and what's not popular. You know, all apologies, but I think Rex Mormon sort of drives that now. People are looking at that and saying, well, what are people talking about? Whether you're, you're whatever, at whatever right. sort of level you are faithfully in yeah. the church, I think we're, we're sort of driving that agenda. And, um, then you, and then you mentioned that you just you know, this is going back to your introduction, but you don't love a coercive style, the way the LDS church uses temples and ecclesiastical endorsements. And, and that fed your interest in ex-Mormon Reddit, right? Yeah. And that's actually what you were talking about when you said, if you go to BCC and you look at, it's sort of the same faces, the same group after yeah. how many years, after a decade. Yeah. Um, the thing I really, really I like mean, they about, have turno they have turnover. They have but, turnover. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dissing that. I'm saying, but I, I would say that Rex Mormon, the thing I really, really like about it is that it's liminal. And that's the word that I love to use with regards to Rex Mormon. It's, it's this liminal community where you're allowed to wander in, use it for a week, use it for a day, use it for a year, use it for 10 years, and you're allowed to wander out and nobody's sort of keeping tabs on you. And in fact, it's one of the few places where people will say, someone will pop up and say, hey, I had a great time here at Rex Mormon. I'm done. I've, you know, I have no more complaints about my life. 
And, but thanks for, you know, the conversation I'm out of here and people are like, high five. Thank you. You're on your way. Right. Right. Even people create fake accounts. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then you really, you talk, I really like what you wrote about the tendency towards cult of personality and leadership worship. Talk about that as a principle that sort of you didn't like about the blogger knuckle, but then informed your interest in, well, uh, in Reddit. Well, and maybe, you know, I don't know if I want to beat up on the beat a dead horse and beat up the blogger knuckle too much. Sure. Maybe we could take it over to Facebook and maybe use Facebook as sort of the comparison to, yeah, to, sure. to Rex Mormon. Sure. Because I think the, the difference I see with, and I think you've probably seen me online at Rex Mormon kind of bemoaning some of the aspects of Facebook and how it, the way it shapes how conversations unfold and, and how communities, you know, develop. There's a premium, I think, in Facebook communities for leading personalities to be right. Or, or not be a premium. There's a sort of, sort of a pressure that if you're the person who's seen as sort of the founding member of this, of this community, we're all using our real names. We're all sort of like getting together and mulling out these ideas. But if you're just, if you're wrong about something and you don't want to sort of, and if, if you're not able to deal with that well, Facebook can be sort of a cruel <laughs> Yeah, you can get banned. You get it's people unforgiving. Kick, kick, it's unforgiving. Kick, and I, you can I, be I, kicked I, out of a group for disagreeing. There's groupthink. There's everybody being scared or worshiping heroes or whatever, right? And and I think our little forum at Rex Mormon maybe handles that in a little bit healthier way, in the right. sense that you really can't come in with and use anything like your history outside of the forum as leverage to say, "Here's the consensus view that I'm trying to build here." A consensus view is going to emerge based on just tons of collective input. It's kind of more democratic, right? It's a little bit more democratic. It's messier. It's more democratic. Um, I I think, and it it can go wrong. I mean, the consensus can go off in ways that are not healthy and and, and kind of scary, but at least you have, you know, that there's always a chance to argue that back to something else. Right. Right. Okay, so I think it'd be cool now to to kind of share the screen and to talk through the anatomy of Reddit, the, the basic mechanics of the site. And for those of you who are joining us either on Facebook, Facebook Live, if those who watch it on YouTube, you can actually see these different features visibly and we'll do our best to describe them for those who have joined us by audio. But I think it's important either for people who don't know Reddit or people who use Reddit but don't really understand all the features that Reddit offers or what's making Reddit successful. Is it okay if we go through the mechanics of Reddit and you talk about um, how these things make Reddit successful? Is that all right? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I, I'm so just looking I, at the front page right now. Yeah. So I will pull up, um, I will pull up the front page and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll share the screen and we'll talk about it. Um, so really quickly, let me just make sure the users can see. Okay, we've got well, the... You're, you're showing the Google Docs. Okay, let me just see here. Your screen sharing is paused. Resume share. That's not what I'm trying to show. Yeah, I think you're trying to show. Um, okay, let me try one more time. Share screen. There we go. Mormon Reddit. All right, so we've got Mormon Reddit now cool. being shared, right? Are you, you're going to do the clicking and I'll just do the talking? Yeah, I will do the clicking and you you do the talking. All right, first thing I wanted to say is that we're looking at the desktop view. Okay. And I think we actually have many more mobile users now than we do desktop users. Right. But when you're using the mobile platform, it kind of comes a little less adorned. So you're not going to see the sidebar. You're not going to see a lot of these options. You're just going to see the conversations. And so I, I would encourage people as sort of a first thing, if you're new to it, especially if you're new to Rex Mormon, Start with the desktop view, so you're able to see sort of what the entire site has to offer. Right, and I think I think listeners can see that. Um, I That's think right. viewers can can see that now, right? They the can. Desktop okay. View. Yeah, yeah. All right. So okay. we're looking at the hot page. So you're sort of your default is you're looking at the hot page, and it's giving you the top posts based on an algorithm that uses upvotes and downvotes to tell us. What's the most popular content in the last 24 hours? Okay, so let's start with what a post is and how people can make a post and what the post, what, what the types of posts are, because that's the basic, isn't that the basic component or brick of, of Reddit? Sure, and I'm, I'm looking, so I'm just gonna start with the first one. Okay. It looks like we've got something like a captioned graphic 
or what some people might call a meme. There's an argument about what the right terminology is there. But in any case, so this is a bit of you know, graphic content. And someone's done that by creating a link to that content. Actually, now with Reddit, I think you actually you can upload that content directly to the post. And then I look below that, and it says update. Here's my story. And if you look to the right, it says self.xmormon. Okay. So, so a self post is basically a text post. So you see the two options there where it says submit a new link. Submit a new link or submit a new, submit text, a new post. text post. Right. That, so either gonna, you're going to link to content, to pre-existing content. Like a news article or a... A news article, you know. A church, press, a church press release or a whatever, right. a, blog, a podcast episode, whatever. You're going you're gonna to drive traffic to an external site through that. Okay. And then below that, you've got a text post, which is going to be your opportunity to tell a story. Which is so, like, my bishop, my bishop was mean to me, or my wife just left me, or mm -hmm. BYU's, just my first cup of coffee. B, 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 a selfie, uh, B, BYU's uh, honor code office is, a, is doing bad things, right? The, those That's sorts it. of stories, yeah. For okay. a selfie, I think you actually go to submit a new link, and they, lay, they allow you to upload the, the graphic. Okay, cool. But in any case. All right. So you've got, you can either do links or text posts or, or photos, right? Yeah. Me memes. All right. So we've got that. What about identity? Talk about the role of identity. So well, Facebook, Facebook, a lot, Facebook requires you to be a real person. Right. X Mormon Reddit does it. My guess is there's pros and cons to that. Talk about the pros and cons. Well, I was anonymous on, on Reddit for, for what? Seven years until up until just this past year. I've been using Chino Blanco, this silly name, uh, to operate anonymously on the site. And I would say 99% of the users on the site are anonymous. And what, are the, course, what all, are the pros and cons of that? Well, it allows you to speak openly about your experience without worrying about any sort of blowback in your, in your real life. And there, there's a huge emphasis among the moderators and among the user base. I mean, privacy is very important. The worst thing you can do on Rex Mormon is dox someone. Which well, means what, to, talk about what dox means. What does dox well, mean? Well, it means, it means providing any kind of document that would out a user of the forum or out an average citizen in a way that's undeserved or uncalled for. To tie their real identity to their, to their anonymous sort of Facebook name, their alias, right? Right. We don't, we don't even for non-users, I mean, just doxing is something we don't want to be in the business of outing people. Okay. So... Okay. And what's the pro and the con of people being able to have uh, anonymous identities in terms of dialogue and discourse? Well, I, th I think the pro is, the, is, is sort of the freedom to have unrestrained, you know, confessional type posts and, and you know, commentary. The, the con is that you're on the internet, you don't know, you, you never know who's a dog. I mean, People can lie, but all, people can people lie, can lie I mean, either way, but it's harder when it's easier to lie when you have no identity, you're not accountable right, for anything and, and, you say, and yeah. you can be mean and nasty, right? You could be rude. Well, I think or, there's, there's actually a pro there in the sense that very quickly you have to develop a sense of a level of skepticism about right. what you're reading. Right. And so I think if you look at the regular users at Rex Mormon, they will very quickly, if something doesn't sound quite right, if it sounds like someone's using an anonymous, especially if they're using a throwaway, what we call a throwaway account, where they create a temporary account to say something that they wouldn't normally say under their own, their own username, you have to look at that and just see, just judging by tone and by the information on offer and, and just be skeptical about it. Right. Nobody's saying you have to believe everything you read on, read on Rex Mormon. If anything, you should be skeptical of everything you read. But would you say the conversations are meaner, less enlightened because than Facebook because people don't have to be responsible for what they say relative to their identity or not? I mean, on, on balance, I would say the conversations at Rex Mormon, to my mind, are friendlier in a lot of ways than the conversations I saw on the blogger, on the blogger knuckle or even in Facebook confrontations. It, I, I think there's less at stake in, the, in these conversations because everyone is anonymous. Got and when it. you take, when you sort of reduce those stakes, then there's less of a tendency to have to defend that to the last, you know, to make a final stand on any, on any issue. So. Okay. Ta so next to my name up here, it says 23,465. It's got post karma and comment karma. Right. What is that? Why is that important so relative that's, that's to say, identity? In aggregate, 
all of the posts that you've put on Ex Mormon to date, you've you've had twenty three thousand some upvotes, okay. right? And and then in terms of the comments that you've made, I mean, it looks like your 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 posting is quite successful, but people aren't real big fans of your commentary, so you might want to work on that. Should I feel bad about that? Oh, totally. She feel she feel terrible. <laughs> could could that also be I don't comment a lot, but I post a lot? Is that also exactly? Possible? Well, you're basically you're basically yeah, and that gets into another thing called blog spam, right? Which of course you're guilty of that. Well, tell yeah, no, talk about that. No one's ever well, talked to me about that before. Okay, so what what's called blog spam is another no no. I mean, it's something that's sort of looked down on in the community. Sort of the way around that is if you're going to post your own content, like if you're basically going to say, hey, I'm here promoting my own blog. I'm here promoting my own podcast. I'm here promoting my own material. You, you can get away with it to the extent that you show up and interact with the community. Show that. Am, am, are, are, you no, this is I'm great. Saying? This is great. Well, yeah. So you're, you're saying. That's why you get away with it, John, because you're good about that. You don't just put something up and then <laughs> as the comments pour in, you don't just stand off and say, hey, I'm busy doing something else. I'm going to let these comments unroll. If you're going to post your own comment or your own content at Rex Mormon, just the polite thing to do is to show up and interact with the users. Okay. And you know so, what? No one's ever told it. me this before and it makes sense to me. And I think on some level, Maybe even subconsciously, I knew it, but this is a conversation I've never had with anyone before, never heard. So it's cool. I, I believe it or not, I'm kind of hearing this a bit for the first time. Um, so, so generally, okay. So just going back, I just want to kind of process this a little bit. We're acknowledging that um, that you know one of the main purposes or values of X Mormon Reddit is that people can post links, uh -huh. right? I mean, that's one of the main components of its success. And yet there's this notion of blog spamming, which is don't just post a link to promote whatever you want to promote and then not interact with the content. Did I capture that right? Exactly. Because people can tell the difference between say I'm posting to a Salt Lake Trib article or I'm posting to my personal blog. There's, there's, there's a differentiation there. Okay. So. Okay. And uh, um, are there any other norms like that that are worth mentioning so that people can know what's polite and what's impolite. And it may be obvious to you guys, but I bet to a lot right. of people, it's not obvious. Well, direct fundraising is something that, that, that is not allowed. Okay. And that's, what, that's a site-wide thing. Okay. Um, that's for understandable reasons. People would be selling t-shirts and CTR rings, CTL rings, WTF rings every day. If okay. there wasn't this rule against, you know, hawking Exmo swag in the forum. Okay. So you're going to run up against that. You know, it gets into gray areas. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, we love Sunstone and there's just some really great voices involved with that community, with that, with that project. But we know those people are, you know, they're salaried. It costs money to go. Uh, there's a certain, you know, so there's gray areas. But if you, if you, I think to the extent that you interact with, with Rex Mormon and it's obvious to folks that you're showing up in good faith to have a conversation, you're okay. Okay. And there's also don't post the same link twice. That's kind of a, you know, it even has mechanisms to prevent that, but we, but, but it's important that once it gets posted, you don't post it. And, again. That, and that should, yeah, there's, 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 there's an automatic mechanism that if it is the same URL that once that, once you post that, it'll say, Hey, this has already been posted. It'll warn you. So that, 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 that's really hasn't been much of an issue in our forum. Right. There are some forums like in some of like the really large, communities where people will say, Hey, you know what? I can get a lot of karma posting to this particular content and people will come in and just dog pile on that, on that content, looking for that payoff. Got it. And that's a, that's not cool. That's not cool. And then what about personal attacks that on the one hand, I know that people have been personally attacked before, but on the other hand, I like Reddit because it generally has that policy of no personal attacks. So talk about that. I, th I think it's, I th you know, I think it's working. I think it's worked. I think it's going to continue to work in terms of where that line is drawn between, you know, an aggressive discussion, you know, characterizing someone's choices. And then when that sort of veers into a personal attack, I, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I would, I would encourage people to use the forum and, and, and get a sense for, for how that plays out, but definitely anything where I'm just saying, you know, John, you're an idiot that's not going to pass muster people, you know, even though it's anonymous, you're not going to wander in under your anonymous handle and have people just coming in and saying, Oh, lob lobbing, lobbing those kinds of attacks at you. What about, um, 
you know, what about like so-and-so's personal life? Like so-and-so's had an affair or so-and-so, you know, got divorced or whatever. When? I know, I know. I'm, I'm asking recent? you what the policy is. I haven't is. read about this. Let me check the front page. Hang on. What I mean is what's the, <laughs> what's the policy on things like that? The, the policy is to be careful not to involve people who we have no business exposing their private lives. Okay. Um, all right, cool. That, I mean, that if, I, if it gets, I, and if I don't want to, I'm not a current mod, so I don't want to speak for the current mod team. Oh, sure. No, no, no. But, for, but during the periods of time that I have been on the mod team, uh, I like the policy that they say, it's, look, if this hasn't been reported in the news, if this is not content that you can draw from an outside source, this is, Rex Mormon is not a platform for like big reveals on people's personal life. And then how do you, how do you handle like a post? How, how traditionally is a post like John DeLynn's a dumbass or I hate Mormon stories and John DeLynn. How, and I'm, not, it's, I'm just using me as one example. Yeah. How do you handle this issue of public figures? Because oftentimes in the broader world, sometimes a public figure is kind of fair game. How do you navigate that with Kate Kelly, with Chris, you know, mm -hmm. Lindsay Hanson Park, with me, with people right. that kind of are public figures in some way? Yeah, I, I, I think with public figures, there's much more leeway given to sort of the kind of commentary that can take place. Where, where that gets nipped in the bud is when it starts descending into acrimonious interpersonal arguments that aren't native to the forum between right. different figures. So I think once the argument between a public figure and someone else becomes personal, acrimonious, and basically stirring up drama in the forum, there's gonna be moves to, to sort of get that out as quickly as possible. But if it's just someone inveighing on whether or not they like Mormon stories versus Mormon matters versus Mormon expression, those kinds of conversations, there's no way that's going to be moderated. You know, folks are gonna be free to have whatever the opinion they wanna have. Okay, got it. Any other just, but before we keep talking about sort of the mechanisms and anatomy of of Reddit, any other huge pet peeves on the part of mods, things not to do, things that really get on the nerves of mods that you can think of, or do we cover the the big ones? Well, I mean, I, I, th I think sort of the number one, if there was no moderation in this forum, what it would look like would be something very different than what it looks like now. Because it's just a lot of, it's the internet. It is, you know, Rex Mormon has gotten to, it's scaled up to a point where what the mods are dealing with is really a lot of garbage that's not worth talking about. It just has to get cleaned up on a regular basis. And so there's trolling. There will be, there will be people making what's comments. What's trolling? For those who don't know, what's trolling? Yeah. Well, well, trolling is basically someone who is leaving commentary designed solely to evoke an emotional reaction on the part of users in the forum. Non-constructive, simply looking to, to stir up some kind of reaction on the part of the user. And I would say the, the, the forum's largely free of that, but, be, but that's because the mods are in the behind the scenes pulling that stuff down and issuing warnings, banning users. But that's, that's really the dregs of, of... Okay, so don't be a troll. Don't be a troll. Don't, don't, don't come in looking to just push buttons. Would it be better... It, so we talked about self-promotion. Would it be better, like, let's say I do a new podcast episode, not to post that, let someone else post it? Is it better if someone else posts a content generator's content than themselves? Would that be preferred? Well, I, I think what you have going for you is that you've been upfront about the fact that you're posting your own content and you've engaged with, with the users. I mean, if you were to, okay, I'll give you an example. If you were to have a new user account called Mormon Stories Reddit Interface Robot. So it's, hey, it's not me doing this, it's this other user who's going to help me upload the content. I think people would see, as long, you know, if you try to automate uploading the content to the forum, you don't want to do that. I mean, you, you right. don't want to yeah, pass yeah. it off to someone else and say, hey, you're going to be the account that's in charge of, you know, basically taking care of this feed to Reddit. It needs, as long as it feels organic. Right. I would say just as long as whatever process you're using is organic and you've got a real live person that's responding to the post, whether it's you or someone else, I think that's probably a moot. What, what about just this idea that let someone else post it. If it's worthy content, let someone else post it. Content generators should just never self promote their own content. Is that, do you think that's the ideal? It's I, yeah, I, I think, Maybe that's the ideal. 
I think one of the problems you run into is if you look at the volume of posts that go up every day at, at Rex Mormon now, I, I've, I was previously pretty much aware of what was going on every single day in that forum. During the last year, it's grown so quickly and gotten so big, there's no way I can keep up with what's being discussed. Right. And I would say that if you're generating content that requires this kind of you know, time involvement, time investment, whatever, it's, there's a good chance it might get missed. I mean, sure. if I were a content, if I were you, if I were a content generator, I would probably figure out a way to get my content posted one way or another. Otherwise, everyone else, there's so much other content swirling around, it's going to get lost in the mix. Sure. Okay, cool. So the, just trying to help people understand etiquette and, you know, good, good community involvement. That's, that, that's why I'm asking I'll, these questions. And one, one thing I would say is I don't actually go online and look for Rex Mormon content anywhere other than just at Rex Mormon. Sure. Like a lot, and I think a lot of people who basically don't have a lot of time in their lives to devote to this topic, this is why it's so great is because you've got this aggregator that you can pop on. It takes you 20 minutes. You can see what everybody's talking about today and, and, and pop off. And I, right. it's sad to say I wouldn't go to Mormon stories if I didn't see it on Rex Mormon saying, Hey, hey this, this is a, this is a podcast that's, you know, topical right. for Rex Mormons. Got it. Okay. What's the role I'm going to share again uh, so that people can see what we're talking about. What's the role of upvoting and how does that, how does that sort of impact things? Okay. So we've got these little up and down voting, right? Mm -hmm. How does that affect anything on Reddit? Well, this is good. This is going to determine the position of the link or the content on the page. And as you get closer to the top of the page, just people are more eyeballs are going to see it. Right. So, you know, your job as a user, should you choose to accept it is to upvote good, con good, worthy content. And to downvote crappy content. And, and generally speaking, you're, you're going to want to use the downvote button sparingly because content that you're simply not interested in is really not worthy of a downvote in, right. to, to my mind. And, and there's, there's actually a whole section on, on Reddit for those who are new. You can go through and just read through what, what's called Redicate. And right. you know, the site will tell you this is what's considered good etiquette or poor etiquette as a user. But generally, generally speaking, using the downvote button as a disagree button is is inappropriate. Oh, okay, that's good to know. Now, yeah, you don't you, just because you disagree with an opinion that's been voiced, you know, is is no is no reason to downvote someone. I, I think where you get into an an opinion that you find is not adding to the conversation, that's what the downvote button's for. Got it. For just not for things you disagree with, but for just bad actors. Oh, it's, so that screen you just pulled up, I mean, there's just, it's, yeah, there we go. More subreddit policies. They've got a link to what's called Reddicut. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean. Got it. No advertising. Yeah. No vote brigading. Army, not, we don't, we don't use the site as our own personal army. Right. Okay. No doxing. Mm-hmm. Uh, no personal attacks. All right, got it. 